this is Ramadan 20th fast, subhanAllah. I can't even believe it is. Ramadan brain in the morning isn't the sharpest of brain. But alhamdulillah, nevertheless, we are here. We are talking about creating a spiritual home as part of our barefoot marriage show that we've been doing for the last few months, alhamdulillah. I know we've been very inconsistent for the last two weeks when it comes to timing and the date and the day itself, but we are back on Sundays. This is our ideal spot, 11 o'clock Sunday morning. You can watch us from your bed if you like, not a problem. <laughs> you can watch us from your sitting room, your kitchen, wherever you are. It's the best time for us, for sure. How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm good. Assalamu alaikum everybody. Good morning, um, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, if you're watching us. Um, yes, it's Ramadan timing and Ramadan schedules and everything is upside down. Um, so um, today is our unusual usual time. Usually we are here for 10, today we are here at 11 and we will review as we go along of um, what timing works. It looks like Sunday is a good day for people to think about their relationships and what we do with Barefoot Institute is we um, help to create confident Muslim families. So we help individuals, we help couples, we help post-divorce, uh, during marriage, before marriage, before you get married, all sorts of things um, that any way, uh, shape or form we can support your uh, relationships, whether it's families, siblings, you know, a whole host of things. And we could all do with some support um, when it comes to relationships. So today we have picked a, a quite interesting topic, um, building a spiritual home. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. Suddenly <laughs> you the, and the camera. The camera fell off. <laughs> can you believe that it fell off? After I, did, I had adjusted everything, I, got, I thought I got everything correct. Even the battery. Like I said to some of you yesterday, this battery that I had waited for, for my Canon camera, had taken me six months to buy because it had been, apparently it's out of stock in every country. So I had to order it from America. Alhamdulillah, it came yesterday, day before yesterday. So I used it last night. It was very good. People were, probably everyone is doing online programs. So everyone yeah, of course, every, of course. So now I've got it connected. I start the program. The okay. camera falls off. We have to be ready for any eventuality. Anyway, so as we are entering the last 10 days of Ramadan, subhanAllah, from tomorrow, I believe. No, today. Tonight, well, depending on when you started fasting. So. Shirin um, Malik says, Salaam Alaikum, Brother Ajmal Henrietta, Wa Alaikum As Salaam. Rakeen says, uh, Wa Alaikum As Salaam. Aisha Begum says, Salaam. Thank you very much for these three people at least who have woken up and have joined us. Well, actually, it's more than three. Alhamdulillah. All of you, welcome. Thank we're, you for being with us today. We're talking about creating a spiritual home. How to create a home that is spiritual for all of us, not just yourself in person, but for the entire family. In itself is a challenge, just keeping your own spirituality up. I found this Ramadan very good, actually. I focused more on my spirituality than even last year. No, mine, this was the hardest for me ever. Oh, whoa, I didn't realize that. Farah Yat Yatali says, Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum as Farah. Farah. Why has it been very difficult for you? This has been the toughest Ramadan and, and it's really interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday and we were talking about how even though the fasting hours are shorter, the actual fast, the going through the day, finding spirituality, connecting has been the hardest. But and why though? I just want to know the reason why. Do you know why? I don't know. I don't know. That's tough because I, um, I'm finding this year very, very good. I have spent more time reading the Quran. I'm ahead, actually, of my everyday target. I've done more studies than ever before. I have done my course with a lot more people in my program and more productive. In, so I've been very happy. Good on you. So let's help those people. No, but I'm, I'm trying to understand what is it that I've found. It's not criticism of you. What's I know it's not criticism. What's it, what is it that I have found that has helped me? And what is it that you, you have found? you tell us. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. What is it that you found? Well, I think, I think it's the mindset. I know you don't like that word. I believe it's the mindset with which I began. So this year, I began with very clear, very specific targets that I will do one, two, and three. I will achieve whatever happens, those three. And also, structuring your day more, uh, uh, more structured days and not fussing around with anything. I haven't fussed around with anything. I actually haven't fussed around with anything. I've just taken it absolutely at my own spiritual pace, I call it. And I'm happy. Good for you. Alhamdulillah. What is it that you have found difficult is what we're trying to understand. I, I think I, I, I spoke about it in a couple of other platforms um, this year that I think there's an incredible amount of pressure on people of how you should be doing the perfect Ramadan and how you should be more effective and most 
you know, connected and all the fluff around this. There was a lot of hype before Ramadan and there was a lot of video, there were a lot of videos going around how to make the most productive, the most efficient, the most wonderful, the most connected. So and you I, had and I think overload. I, I think I think it's actually a lot of pressure on people. Do you know too. what I did? I didn't read or watch any of those videos. Not a single one. No, but they come up on social media. I you still will, haven't you will see them. And and I think there is there is within within households, I think also there is pressure. There is there is there is, there is an unspoken pressure of this is how it should be. And I think that's a for me, at least, and I think probably a lot of converts who, who after many, many years of trying really hard of, of making the best of Ramadan, we still struggle. And uh, I also know people who have been Muslims all their life and they still struggle. They pass out during the day because they can't manage. So I, I believe that we have to, first of all, when it comes to spirituality, we have to set our own pace. We have to be really comfortable with what I can manage and what I can't manage. And, you know, I don't think there was a lack of planning. You know, you take out any of my journals and there's all the planning of how many Jews I want to read, how many things I want to do. It's not the lack of planning. I, I don't think I was lacking in the planning of it. I think it's over plan. No, I, I didn't over plan. Actually, I was really clear that I am not going to be setting unreasonable targets for myself. I'm not going to say I read the Quran in one day and <laughs> finish the whole thing. But what, you, what you're describing to me. What you're describing to me, and I'm hearing it from an outsider, from your description, it, it's coming across as, and I could be completely wrong, that you're, you've over-pressurized yourself by reading over too much information, so information overload, and you've over-planned, and you've complicated what I believe is a very simple and very profoundly personal journey. That's how it's landing. I'm not sure if I'm getting it right or wrong. No, I don't think you're right because I, I was very realistic with my planning. I, I think what happened is probably is that the physical aspect of fasting has really taken a toll um, this year. And it's really strange because when uh, you remember four or five years ago, we had this six, 18 hours, 19 hours of fast. That was the year when I came back from Spain. And I was terrified that I'm not going to be able to, to do it. And I still managed to do the fasting. Whereas this time is shorter, but there is something different. Um, about the struggle. So I guess for every year there's a different struggle. This is my conclusion. Is that how do I, how do I now switch and how do, to, to those of us who haven't actually felt that we have made the best of Ramadan, how do we get, gather our thoughts and spirituality in a different way so we can actually make use of the last 10 days? Um, so I think that's what my take is for today. This is where I am. Okay, so how do we create the in. best home in terms of spirituality. That's all we're trying to establish today, ladies and gentlemen. And if you've got any suggestions, tips, please go ahead. Alison El Tawil, I really like her surname. El Tawil means somebody who's tall. Mm. So Alison, uh, you must be very tall to have a, such a nice name, or at least the name that says Alison the Tall. Um, it is so tough if you have to get up early to go to work and be alert. Um, you just want the week to go quickly <laughs> so you can sleep in the weekend. So wishing days of Ramadan away, away which is sad which is sad yes of course yeah of course. I, I had feelings like this in the last couple of days is that you know and when everything goes upside down I I really struggle with the timetables you know everything is you know scattered and you know you, you have a very different rhythm you know until 11 o'clock literally we have to be quiet because you're still sleeping so th there have been a, for quite a few challenges I think this year which but it's been the same every year for Ramadan. I'm awake all night and I sleep in the morning. Yeah, so, but with age, obviously your tolerance level is less than my tolerance level is. I do not complain about anybody making any noise. I'm asleep. I know you're very kind that you guys stay quiet. Mm. But I, if you're pottering upstairs and making noise, that's unfair. Downstairs you can do what you like. It doesn't bother me. I don't hear anything. When I'm asleep, I'm asleep. <laughs> that's how it works. But, okay, let's not... So let's Let's not personalize those nitty gritties, but what we want to do is creating a, create a space. So what is a spiritual space? That's the first question we need to answer. What is it? In Islam, a spiritual space is where you are conscious of Allah's presence in your life all the time. That's a simple definition. I know it is very simple. For some of you, it may be too simple. What is Allah's presence in your life? Being aware, being fully aware of the fact that Allah knows, hears, sees everything. Nothing can be hidden from him. If we can create that, that spiritual awareness first. So the first point of spiritual home is to create a space in our mind of Allah's presence in our life. Yes, in a way that you, what, what we are saying is that it, you ha we have to create space in our head for God. I think that's really, and, and one of the big takeaway for me is 
every year when I go through, through, through fasting, every year is that I don't need to, so what we need to focus on is what are the practices and the Sahabas themselves, they used to prepare for Ramadan for six months before Ramadan and they carried on the message, whatever they learned six months after Ramadan. Oh, you know what happened with me? What may have actually spiritually boosted my preparation for Ramadan. Remember, I went on a very strict diet two month, one month before Ramadan. Right. I did a two months, no carb, no sugar diet for two months, one month before Ramadan. That's what has done an amazing job for me. I think mentally, and I'm a, anyway, not a very foodie person, as you know, mentally it shifted it completely. So the concept of dieting or strict diet became absolutely part and parcel of my three months of this period, right? Two months before and this month. Mm. So maybe that's what had happened to me. Probably. Anyway, let's go back to the mental shift. Yeah, so, so, so it, it's about really taking Ramadan as a, as a training ground and taking it as... What are the practices that I am able to continue after Ramadan? No, that's later. Because I think, no, that's later. I know, but it, it, I, for me, it's, it's a lot of pressure when you start pressurizing yourself, thinking, I need to do this in Ramadan, but is it going to be sustainable? Okay, can I, can I just do the first thing first, which is, we've just said, Allah's presence in our life. We just need to finish that one, then we can come to this one. Allah's presence, and you, you put it in a very nice way. You said, Allah in your head. What did you, what was the Make word? space for God in your head. Yeah, I, I, love you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I really like that phrase. It caught my attention. Make space for Allah in your head. What, what does it really mean? I, I, I need you to explain that because I don't think everyone understands it. Well, for me, the, the idea of it, this is part of taqwa. This yeah, is, it is taqwa. This is to remember that just like we make space for shopping lists, we make space for um, to do lists, we make space for cleaning the house we have to clear some space for practices for mm. spiritual practices and it, it requires preparation especially for people who haven't been brought up with this so for example for for someone who was not brought up with the idea that the quran was regularly going um, i need to make space for it i need to be very conscious that in ramadan i will make an extra effort so there's always a quran going at the background it's not something that i grew up with it's not natural to me and I think a lot of the people who haven't, if they haven't fasted, uh, even they are Muslims, but they haven't fasted, but, or their family setup wasn't such, that certain things are not indication that God is present in your head. So I think what, what you said as a second point, which is how do you continue this very practice of God being present in your head? If we put those two together, then it may be a good idea to actually get into a habit of having the Quran in the background at least once a day playing out of your whatever... Uh, gadget that you're playing with at least once a day for half an hour every day mm. so that becomes a habit a, a, a culture of your family rather yeah. than just doing it in Ramadan so I, I, I like the transition uh, so in the month of Ramadan you make that conscious effort you want to create a space for Allah in your head the first step you do is you make some conscious planning one of them like you said why not play the Quran at least once a day out loud in the house so everyone can hear it and the space that is in the house mm. feels like Allah's presence is there physically. I mean, it could be one way. I mean, That's obviously, a good way. And obviously, I like there that. are a lot of people who have got different ideas. So please share your ideas with us. But one of the things that I really enjoyed this Ramadan is that the uh, Cambridge Muslim College, uh, Cambridge uh, Central Mosque, they have regular programs, and what they do is they have every the day before they recite the juice and they do it with English translation under the Arabic. So I can follow both while I'm sitting there. And even if I'm not reading it because I'm so tired, I'm still getting something that I can read the translation as well as follow the Arabic and I can connect the meaning. And I have done it almost every day Very good. Uh, this Very Ramadan. Good. So, so I, I really want to see this happen more often. Then. We need to find a way in our house for continuation of this spirit. And that is we need to find uh, some program that we like, which has got Arabic and English recitation and following. And it, it can be done at least once a day, even if it's t 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But mm. the background uh, recitation should continue for half an hour. That's, mm. that's something that we can do. Uh, Ra Rakin says, um, many people struggle with Ramadan. It has to be personal for everybody. Very true. Mm. Shireen Malik says, I think it's important we keep things small and realistic. Very true. Yeah. And Rakin again says, everyone is different and so can achieve different amounts of ibadah. True. But yeah. Allah is so kind. He has created the bottom line, ibadah, as very basic. Only five daily prayers. Each prayer takes 10 minutes. Mm. That's the bottom line. Everyone can achieve that. He wants you to fast only 30 days a month, uh, 30 days in the year, not every day. 
So these kind of bo basic bottom line that unites us are the best ways of making sure that we are all together. Anyway, so the first thing is to have Allah present in your life. So the way I look at Allah's presence in my life is that everything that I do, I'm consciously aware that Allah is watching me. Hmm. If you're watching me all the time, how will I behave? Oh, he would be scared of me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would be scared of anybody. But it, you will be aware of somebody else's eyes on you. You won't do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. Hmm. You would otherwise do on your own. Um, so if you can think about Allah is watching you all the time, there's a video camera focused on you. Like now, for both of us, we won't be, doing, we won't be poking our nose, for example, <laughs> out of embarrassment. But Allah is watching us all the time. If I can think about that as my second point, so the first point, as Hannah said, making space for Allah in our head. Secondly, uh, r really accepting that Allah is watching us all the time. Mm. That's very powerful. Now, there is a problem here. If Allah is watching us all the time, what about when we go to the bathroom? What about we are in our yeah. own private space? Yes, Allah is aware of what you're doing. Allah is not shy of the fact that these are his creation's natural ways of living. So don't worry about it. Don't be OCD about them, as I say. These are part and parcel of life, right? If these are part and parcel of life, you just enjoy, embrace the realities of your life, but do them as if Allah is watching you. Therefore, you're not doing anything unnatural or haram. Mm. That's it. Just live your life. I actually, I actually connect this to something else as well, that how do we make space um, in our head? It's just like when you are used to listening to music when you're young. Um, so certain so things you do. I'm not. So you have to so tell I us. am. I was used to listening to music because that, that was my culture. So it's it's that shift has to happen because just like if you always listen to music, you think it's normal, and that's the the tone of your day. That's every single time you sit in the car, the first thing you do is you touch. And I know a lot of lot of Muslims still do. Um, you touch the button and you start listening to the music or radio or whatever cassette or DVD or not cassette but DVD you have. Um, a CD you have in your player. So it's that tone setting that's hard to break unless you're conscious of it. Yep, good. So that's so. let's let's do that. Let's create Allah Allah's presence in our life by making space for Allah in our head. And secondly, be aware of Allah watching you and I all the time. Al Tawil have said has said, I love to play the Quran in the background, but worry that if someone starts speaking, I have to quickly switch it off. Is that true? Well, there is a difference here. The little difference of opinion is like this. If the Quran is being played in the background and nobody is listening, according to some scholars, that's a sin. Because Allah's order in the Quran is, uh, whenever Quran is being recited, listen to it. That's the order of Allah. Mm -hmm. But recited verbally by somebody physically sitting next to you is what this is meaning. Mm -hmm. Okay? If that, that, but at the time of Rasulullah, there was no audio machine that would be playing or a uh, or a video machine, or anything like that. Now we do. So can we create this? Because a human being cannot recite the Quran for 24 hours a day, sitting down in one place for you. They can't. Impossible. They'll mm -hmm. probably do 20 minutes, and you can listen to that, and they can disappear. But an audio, or a video machine, or whatever you're listening to, that can go on and on in a loop for 24 hours a day. Does the same rule apply? No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It's better for you to listen to it, if you can, but if you put it in the background, so every now and again you're catching verses, and that's triggering you into remembering Allah, that's good. That's very good. As opposed to having that background musical clutter that I call, mm. which is occupying your mind. Every now and again, a tone comes and you start humming with it. Instead of that, you have Allah's words playing at the background. Every now and again, when you catch it, you hum with it. Fantastic. So there is no problem, al tawil in you doing that. Keep the Quran on is not the same thing as a human being reading it because human being won't be, human being won't be able to read for 24 hours a day. That's right. I, I'm, I'm the kind of person I like to sit down and if I have 20 minutes, I would have my notebook with me. I would sit in front of the television and I would take notes. This is how my at attention span is. I, if it's at the background, I will not pay attention, especially when I'm driving. I know I will be having still a road rage because someone is driving horribly. So that really defeats the purpose of listening to the Quran. So I, would, I, I personally would rather sit down and have that 20 minutes, half an hour concentrated focused attention i don't have that problem i say put it on keep it on even if i'm not listening i will catch various words and okay. that's enough for me sometimes i will of course know the whole soul and i'll recite with it mm. but that one or two recitation words really powerful for me it's the same thing as when i'm driving in the car if something is going on at the background or i put the radio on i listen to the mm. uh, conversation radios most of the time when i'm driving um, and it's good for me because 
things they're saying enables me to connect with the world, but at the same time, my brain is carrying on. I'm doing my things. Anyway, so people are different. We have to accept that. That's okay. right. So part of building a spiritual home is to find your ways and implement a bit of both or find something that will work for both of you. R Rubia has said something very nice. Rubia Mirza says, ASA, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. When they say ASA, I will read ASAP as soon as possible. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Rubia. Brother Ajmal and Sister Henrietta, space for Allah in your head. Be thankful. Say Alhamdulillah and Subhanallah. Say Astaghfirullah. Do dhikr. Pray durood. Listen to Arabic Quran and read the translation daily, regularly. Pray five daily prayers. We all have, we are all different. We do the best we can. Our Allah knows our strengths and He, Alhamdulillah, struggles, struggles of course, and He is alhamdulillah very understanding and very generous i like that if that works for all of you the sister is giving us tips of what to do i do like the idea of subhanallah alhamdulillah allahu akbar astaghfirullah regularly as becoming part and parcel of our tongue so the third point i was going to make is we've made the headspace mm. we've made the space that allah is watching me all the time physically the second thing we're going to do is get allah on our tongue mm. get allah in our tongue and that's what i love zikr for me, dhikr isn't sitting together and doing. Hmm, hmm. Oh, well, uh, I love that. I know you do, but that's not me. I don't. I think that's just. That, I think that's diminishing zikr's and its importance to a a, a collective uh, uh, sing-song ritual. But anyway, uh, each to their own. I like to wa use the words of Allah in my tongue and say that Subhanallah, Astaghfirullah. Or even if somebody is singing a song, so I like ninety-nine names of Allah sang in a song format. Love it, and I can hum with it even though my voice is terrible mm. but nevertheless it works for me i don't know what works for you yeah. oh I, I love listening to all kinds of zikr um i particularly like the north african style and and even if i'm, I'm not even if i'm not doing it just to listen to the melodious tone it's just sometimes it, it gets to my body it's it reminds me of a very deep connection of of movement and god's name and and all all of that together it's really um and our neighbor has been very kind because he's been probably bringing some wonderful olive bread <laughs> well we have a very good greek neighbor who <laughs> always brings amazing food for us he just knocked on the door and we can't of course break our show to go and pick it up i no. think our son has done that but nevertheless brothers and sisters i also like that i also like that but what i'm saying is um there is no there is nothing more powerful than actually remembering allah with your verbal action so you are physically reciting my only contention with this one is always that it becomes habitual for a lot of people who grow up with it and again it's it's something that people find very natural um but i, I think it's just like with gratitude uh, what i'm learning about gratitude is there are two kinds of gratitude one is that you say that i'm grateful but the really important part of gratitude is to actually feel it and experience it it's I, not I, enough I, to I think say it's both, both. But it's not enough to say I'm grateful. But one does fall, one follows the other. If I say to you I love you, for example, mm. which I do, even if I say it, you should not judge my intention for it. You should accept it that I'm meaning it, even if I don't mean it. The fact that I've said it, the fact that I've reaffirmed it, and if I say that regularly, I will eventually believe it if I don't believe it. You fall in love eventually. <laughs> that's the truth. With Allah, it's the same thing. Th that's why Rasulullah said, if you are making dua, and if you can't cry, pretend to cry. He uses the word pretend to cry. Why did he say that? Mm. Pretending meaning if you try your level best to cry, eventually you will learn to cry in front of Allah. It will not have an embarrassment. It will mm. overcome your ego. The same goes for gratitude. Mm. Saying the words of Allah, subhanAllah, glorifying Him. Alhamdulillah, thanking Him and praising Him. Astaghfirullah, re repenting for your mistakes. Regular, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar is also glorifying Allah. Regularly saying that, even if it's not coming from a conscious space, it is better than me uttering words of rubbish in my mouth. Hmm. That's how I look at it. So it's like bottom line, really. Hmm. The bottom line value is this. But yours is ideal. If I could sit down, take half an hour out and really thank Allah consciously, that's amazing. But even if it's not sitting down for half an hour, but I think just a practice of and how we are wired is actually this is really I, I think I, I, I can see why Ramadan is is so important is because it's such a training ground for the soul. Hmm that we know this you know we talk about this all the time we talk about it outside of ramadan we hear it all the time if you're growing up with it you know this stuff do you remember when you went to your leadership training mm. and they told you to climb a pole right. and stand at the top yeah you screamed well done because you were afraid of heights yeah but they pushed you 
they didn't push me. They, they said, you need to make a decision. You can lose out on this opportunity or you get yourself together and go h as far as you can go on the pole. So you need to get yourself together, right? Yeah. And eventually you conquered that fear. I went all the way to the top <coughs> of the pole and I went halfway through. I, I walked across. So you conquered that fear. Yeah. How did you do it? I just wanted to prove to them that I can do it. <laughs> but why was it important to prove to them that you can do it? Because I felt I can do it. Inside uh, of me, I felt that it is possible to do it. And I think Ramadan is the same. I don't feel the same about Ramadan yet. Okay, but that's my point. So if you, you have to consciously get to that point that I really need to, because ultimately there is nothing more worthy in the eyes of Allah, a special worship than Ramadan. That mental switch. Prayer, Allah loves, of course. Yeah. But fasting is more special, Allah says. You fast for me or my servant, because you can't pretend you're fasting. When you fast for me, I will be your reward. Allah will be the reward for it. If you can see that and say, okay, how do I gain Allah as the reward for everything that I do? And then you say, okay, I need to prove myself. Yes, I can do it. Nothing will stop me. Just like that pole and the conquering no, the well, I can do. I do because I fast. So that's not an issue. But I have a very high standard for myself. So my fasting, I consider my fasting rubbish, to be honest. I think I'm doing it. I'm doing the physical act. Does it really change me? Does it give me the... Does it elevate my spirit? And I don't feel it does. But I think you've just said something amazing. Something very profound. And every now and again you say things profound and I pick, pick them up. Pick <laughs> on them. And then you just, you just said that you have created yourself a high standard. That is important. But that high standard is, according to one of our sisters, is too high for you. Hmm. Perhaps it's not realistic enough. Perhaps it's not achievable for human beings on this earth. Perhaps it will only come in the heavens. We have to wait to get there, right? Mm. To get there, you have to do the earthly thing, which is go through the struggle. Maybe. Okay, let's go to uh, Sabi is it Sah Shahina. Shahina Chowdhury. Sorry. So some say, listen to the du'as, Quran, leave it on even in your sleep, uh, as the brain subconsciously, spiritually listens to the words even in one's sleep. What are your thoughts? I agree. I actually do that myself every night. This Ramadan you do it. You know, I have been struggling to sleep. I've been. This is the first time in my life I've been struggling to sleep. So before I go to sleep, I've got this amazing headphone that blocks off the whole world. I can't hear anything. And I put the Quran on at the lowest volume. And I'm listening to the Quran. I'm repeating the words of Allah every so often in my sleep. And as I'm dr drifting in and out of my sleep, eventually I fall asleep. Mm. And it's beautiful sleep. Really beautiful sleep. That conscious, subconscious words of Allah soothed me into my sleep. But also, that was the, that was the last thing I heard before I went to sleep. And if I died... I hope, inshallah, that would be my means of salvation. So, yes, my dear sister, Shahina, it's a very good thing to do. The only problem is, if you keep it on, if it disturbs somebody else, and if they curse you, then you'll be in trouble in the Day of Judgment. So, if you're going to listen to the Quran, put an earphone on. either put an earphone on or ask their permission, or they make, make sure they have a full buy into this idea. I don't want to disturb you, so I put my headphone on. Hmm. And I know if I put it on, you will, you will not be able to sleep. No. And you've already gone to sleep long before me anyway. I have come to sleep later, so it's not fair. You literally just wake me up <laughs> every so time I, you come to the room. So I will put my headphone on and I will listen to it, alhamdulillah, and I'm fine. My son, when he was younger, I remember, he would wake up in the middle of the night and he would be scared and he would put the ayatah down and put the Quran on. And sometimes I'd go to his room at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and I would hear the Quran going on and I'll switch it off and I'll ask Ibrahim what happened. He would say I had a nightmare, so I put the Quran on. That was his comfort. Mm. And it's a very good comfort to have. So I really like this idea, Shahina. Don't worry. Put it on. Put the adhkar. Put the Quran on. It's about making Allah present in your life. That's, that's all taqwa is. Mm. If you want to know what taqwa is, it's all about making Allah present in your life. So we've discussed three main points, right? Making space for Allah in your life means... In your head. In your head. Um, accepting Allah is watching you all the time. And the third is in your tongue. Yeah. Adhkar, Quran, whatever you can. Good right. words. Yeah. So what would be the fourth, my... You go ahead. I have mine, but carry on. My, my suggestion, the, the fourth, is particularly for Ramadan. Uh, but again, just bear in mind, what are the things that you will be able to do after Ramadan? What are the practices? You know, we can, of course, boost ourselves and we use a lot of things, just like when you have a detox or you have something on your body, you boost your, your energy system. How, when we boost ourselves, how do we and what do we keep up after Ramadan? One of the things that we like doing in our home and our house is we, um, I have a regular weekly teaching session with the kids. And um, we learn various things. One of my favorite things that we study together is Imam Al-Ghazali's work. 
Uh, both of my teenagers are terrified because they say they don't understand the language. So it's literally going through very slowly um, a book together, a chapter, half a chapter, a page, depending on what you can do and breaking it down. Now, there are two things that happen with this. One is I believe that our children are not in touch with traditional learning. It's all about iPad, all about Google, all about, you know, you know, everything digital. So sitting down and reading a book together, it's a very traditional way of learning. And that also means that they have to understand certain words that they wouldn't necessarily think about. It also means I, we have to have conversations. So it's, it's a great conversation starter. You know, you get to know about things that they do at school that they would never tell you otherwise. Um, and not because you are trying to excavate it from them. It's just because that's the flow of a conversation. They will have a story attached to something we talk about. So what we were doing this um, just before Ramadan, and we will probably go and, and get another one. Um, we are going through the alchemy of happiness, which is looking at the soul, looking at mindset, thinking, how to navigate yourself. And we just do very, very short, half an hour, 45 minutes on a Saturday usually. Um, and it's, I think it's a fabulous way to bring more um, practical application because I think so we'll study we together, study together, but, but study something Reflective. that is traditional, that is not, because studying the Quran is very different. And we, you do that with the children and, and I sit in sometimes, um, but studying something that is an applicable subject for them. But generally study together, whether you study the Quran in the uh, traditional way or study um, with a tool such as a book, a self-help book, creative book, Al-Ghazali, or whoever it is. Fantastic. So study together will also create a spiritual space. I, I love the idea. I also like, love the idea of praying together. So in this month of Ramadan, I have prayed most of my prayers with my, my children, um, and I have enjoyed that. So my son Ibrahim and I, we pray Taraweeh every day together. It's really beautiful. I like it. He, he leads one day, I lead the other day. He's 12 years old, but it doesn't matter. He's memorizing the Quran. I encourage him to lead, and I lead. So we rotate, and he likes it, and I like it. And we don't do too many, as many as he can take. So usually four. Um, we're going to increase that to eight rakah in the last 10 days of Ramadan. And I have also encouraged him to come to the mosque for the qiyam, not the tarawih itself, but qiyam that we're going to have a, be having in our local mosque, um, extra prayers. It's up to him if he wants to come during the holiday period when school is closed. He can come. It's a weekend, of course. Today is a weekend day. Tomorrow is going to be another one because of bank holiday. But either way, it's something to encourage. So pray together. And they do say, don't they, Hannah? Families that pray together stay together. Yeah. It is a powerful tool to keep you united. So please, brothers and sisters, don't just be selfish and pick up your musalla and pray in your own room quietly and privately. Pray together. Give the qama downstairs or upstairs and invite your family, your husband, your wife, your parents if you live with them, your brothers, sisters if they're around you, and your ch children most importantly. So your wife and your husband and your children, make that a regular thing. If you can pray all five daily prayers together in a jama'ah, ah, you're getting 27 times more reward for praying in jama'ah. Ah. You're also getting more reward because it's Ramadan and you're also benefiting by the fact that you're spiritually connecting with your family. Pray together, you last together. So that was the fifth. That's the fifth one, correct. So first one, Allah in your head. Allah in your thought that he's watching you. Th uh, third one, Allah in your tongue. F study together with your family. Uh, Allah in your education. And f fifth one, Allah in your worship by praying together as a family. So we've suggested five very basic things so far. We'll do, do more inshallah. So five things that you should do. Any thoughts on those Five ideas that we proposed. Shaheen Ahmed says, my recommendation Any on... Any recommendations. Oh, go ahead. Any recommendations on what can be done with toddlers with low attention span and they're under the age of five. Well, I can't suggest anything except have a lot of fun with it. Yes. Um, you know, I, I still miss the days when the kids were little and we used to make Ramadan decorations and do all those things. And of course, before we have done They're not rebelling already. against Ramadan decoration. Now we just laugh because they we put up something a couple of <laughs> weeks ago and they looked at me, mom, it's so cheesy, take it off. So we did. Um, but with young children, you know, there are uh, one of one of the, um, I have it on the bookshelf and maybe if you can bring it, we can we can show it. It's a beautiful little book. It's for young children. Which one? It's called it? Polishing the Heart. Oh, I um, can't see it. And it's packed with activities. It's on the top um, of the bookshelf. Okay, you carry on talking. I'm going to go and check it. Yeah, there are a couple of... Uh, so, so the whole uh, series, 
actually that have been we have been using from a very young age with the kids and you can do that because they have printable worksheets and you can photocopy them you can give it to the children and they don't require a lot of time but it's a it's a quality that you want to spend with the children even if it's 10 15 minutes 10 minutes or five minutes with a child if it's quality it makes all the difference we, we used to make um, cards um, when they were little we used to take out the shape of a date and we wrote a hadith on it and we had a conversation that's one of them and there is another one the last one the gold one there's a gold book yeah that's sorry my husband is just getting some of the books that i want to show you and and i really highly recommend this so this one is called painting heaven uh, polishing the uh, mirror of the heart and as you can see these are um, very beautifully designed um, books and all of them colorful you know very engaging and one page a day would would do wonders um, also they have broken it down into various subjects so one of them is called the book of knowledge and the book of knowledge it's actually a whole series of Imam Ghazali's uh, books and as you can see lots of really interesting activities that are suggested talking about hypocrisy anything to do with personal and spiritual development a really beautiful series of books um, the other one which is the book of belief for children it's again particularly it's a very um, well written with lots of cartoons in it so it's relatable it's fun for the kids and it really what it does is it brings the family together so you talk about important things about character about development about how to recognize signs of hypocrisy for example because these are the things that our children don't get at school so it's i think it's part of the moral teachings yeah the moral failing in our society mm -hmm. is that they don't get moral teachings at schools and also for children please don't give them tafsir of the quran at the age of five they won't understand anything <laughs> Don't start giving them long lectures and demanding that they should pray with you for long. That's not acceptable because those children need their playtime. Prophet Sallallahu look at how beautiful Prophet was. Prophet Sallallahu was in Sijda one day and the companions were waiting for him to come out of the Sijda. Mm. He stayed in Sijda for a very long time, for a very long time. Mm. Some of the companions thought revelation is coming from the heavens. Mm. They did not move. They stayed with him. When Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi finished his prayer, they said, Ya Rasulullah, you stayed in Sijda very, for a very long time. This is not very normal. Was a, did a revelation come? And do you want to tell us about it? Prophet Sallallahu said, no, there was no revelation. <laughs> so why did you stay in the Sijda? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, my grandson Hassan, Hussein, one of them, was on my back. And he was using my back as a slide. <laughs> so he's coming on and off, on and off from my back. And he was enjoying it so much that I did not want to disturb his play. So I stayed in Sijda and I let him play. Subhanallah. Mashallah. Subhanallah. Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a congregational prayer with all his companions in his mosque mm. allowed his, son, his grandson to make it slide. use his back while he's in sajda as a slide. Mm. And he did not disturb him. He did not want to disturb his play. And he allowed all the companions, in fact, not allowed, he, taught, he practiced something amazing. He taught his companions to allow children to be playful. So if you can't allow children to be playful at their playful age, when will you allow them? When they become old, they'll be too serious for you. So and play with them when they're younger. Anyway, lots and lots of points are coming through. I saw someone... Um, Let me go up again. So, uh, Suhail Ullah says, Salaamu Alaikum, any recommendations on books you have been reading or are reading current? You have been reading too many books, brothers. That's all, to... all we do. We, <laughs> we read all the time. We pile of books in my room. If you come to my study room, there's about 10 of them stacked up together. I'm reading them all, so I don't know which one I should suggest. But may I recommend you my marriage book? <laughs> Be a cheeky one. Or my wife's own book called The Heart Smart. You can buy those bo both from our uh, page. I'm reading a book on history at the moment. But I'm also reading the Quran. I'm also reading the Seer. I'm also reading the Hadith. I'm also reading books of Dua. So you can, you, you have to have a library of books in which you can sit there and read as much as you like. I, I am reading Discipline and Self-Examination by Imam Ghazali. It's a very, very short but very compact and it's extremely dense book. So I can manage probably a, a page a day. Um, but it's very deep and it's it's quite transformative actually it's talking about six seven principles of what how you watch yourself and examine and how you evaluate 
your cell phone. I find it very useful. Where's the book? Is it here? I think it's somewhere there. It's, it's well, I'm not going to get Books are all over scattered <laughs> in our house. Um, Shirin Dawood says, Salam, can you get these books on Amazon? Yes, you can. I think you can because, no, actually, we got it delivered in America and someone brought it over to yeah, us. My, my, it um, might be available by now, but it's actually, it's the Ponce Vitae um, production. So either from their website, I think they probably by now, they should have a, a UK distributor. Fine. And you can have uh, another question here. Fatima Um Hamza says, listening to you whilst working. So, so missed parts of your conversations, but I agree with the pressure part. I thought I had it all planned out before Ramadan. However, with three boys, five years old and under, it's proving to be very challenging with Ramadan. Absolutely, I totally understand. School, my work. School, pre work, preparing for iftar and sahri in advance. Feels like I'm on call 24-7. I'm like so sorry. <laughs> like headless chicken. As, as we said it at the beginning of Ramadan, I, I think Ramadan is a personally tailor-made struggle for everybody every year. And every one of us will have different struggles. Every one of us will have, go through cycles of the same struggles. But every one of us is getting what we are supposed to be dealing with. So your your challenge this Ramadan is how do you deal with busyness? How do you create more space for God in that very busy schedule? Yes, correct. How do you make more time, even though it looks impossible, we can only find time for the things that we actually want to find. And enjoy. Uh, of course, but we need to make time for the things that are important. So my request um, or a kind of poking for you, if you accept it from me, how do you make more time for Allah in your head? You know, in Jewish tradition, there is something very beautiful. I, I always find it beautiful that Jewish women particularly, they have this practice that anything they do, they re discover, they release it as a way of ibadah, as a way of worship. They clean the floor, mop the floor, it's part of ibadah. They clean the kitchen ta uh, kitchen counter, it's part of worship. So I find it very, very useful when I was, but this is what also, so I said. When everything. I was with young children, everything you do is part of your ibadah. So if you can start thinking about your busy schedule from that perspective, it will get done quicker. Isn't there is it, more it, barakah in time. Anna, the sisters running around with children, cooking, mm. cleaning, providing all of those, each and every one of them are rewardable. Of course they're rewardable. In fact, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said these are some of the biggest rewarding uh, actions you can undertake in life. Subhanallah, my dear sister, never underestimate the power of what you're doing. Absolutely. It's just that you have, you, have this, you, have, you think you're doing it like a headless chicken. Yes, that's yourself perhaps, but you are actually being rewarded for being a headless chicken in that particular situation. Absolutely. How do we make better use of that? Lots of other points have come in. Um, Shaheen Ahmad said, Jazakallahu khayran for recommendation. I'm usually guilty of not praying with my family because I feel the toddlers will disrupt my prayer. We'll take tips into account. I also want to re-emphasize, my dear brother, do, Shaheen, do take your toddlers with you when you're praying. Hold them. When my daughter and my son were little, and I am an imam, I used to take them to Jum'ah with me. I delivered khutbah with my daughter and my son, uh, one at a time, of course, on a sling on my right in front of me, right here. And I'm delivering a khutbah, a speech from the pulpit of the mosque. I'm leading prayers with my children attached to my body. Nobody bat an eyelid. If people were uncomfortable, that's their problem. I think people were waiting for my children to cry. But they subhanAllah, never they never ever cried. Only once I remember, and it was a, a miracle. I was at Good Street Mosque, and suddenly in the middle of my khutbah, suddenly Brent said, I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> there I am in the middle of the khutbah. What would Rasul do? He would have said to everybody, just hold on guys, I'm going to come back. And everybody would have waited. And I decided to do exactly that. But I looked in the audience, subhanAllah, lo and behold, right in the middle of the audience was my cousin. Mm. I said to him, Cousin, come, come to the front. He take, came. Amazing. Take Ibrahim to the toilet. He goes, of course I can. And Ibrahim knew my cousin, so they went. Alhamdulillah, saved the, saved the day. But never did they have, because they've been trained, they've understood that they have a role to play in all of that. Not to be um, holding back their natural rhythm, but to be enjoying what they're experiencing. And they did. They all grew up in the mosque with us. Alhamdulillah. So please don't worry about children crying and screaming in the mosque. It's okay. If they start crying they need help and support and comfort and you can help them inshallah it's next part of our mosque culture as well isn't it that they some mosques are not welcoming children because they think they are a disruption but terrible it's a very bad culture because if you are not making the mosque home for your children there is nobody going to be going there yeah the mo so your mosque will it be will empty, be empty. Yeah. so please share your words of wisdom for those younger generations in their teens that struggle with creating a spiritual home we will come to that in a minute shirin says book secret of divine love by halwa very good. Thank you, Shireen. Thank Allah you bless sharing. you. And um, we all need to share good things with one another. The more we share, the better it is. 
so we've got five points as we've listed that we should do regularly. Um, and somebody, I think you could cover the Sha Shaheen's point about teenage children. I think someone else also asked about teenagers. Teenagers spend a lot of time on their phone, and how do you, what do you do in Ramadan? So, so I have a very, we have a very basic principle in our house. The phone use is uh, restricted um, still um, in our house. But for those of you who who don't have this principle, so I, I, I think this is how it goes. What children remember is not what you tell them. It's how they feel in the house at home so uh, what kind of mood and and energy you create in ramadan how you prepare for iftar how you involve children um, teenagers i mean in in the preparation of, or, of, of iftar those memories are just think about your own self what you remember is your own memories of what smells you had what food uh, associations you made because the body is a very very important process in this we take up memories in our bodies not just in our mind it's not just a memory bit it's it's the body that is remembering your ramadans and how it felt and how wonderful it was and how horrible it was um so with teenagers it's it's give them tasks involve them make ask them to make iftar one day ask them to help you distribute food if you are giving food to the neighbors we used to make uh, last year year before last we made packs um, for the surrounding families uh, little Ramadan packs with chocolate and some sweets and some dates and some food in it and we gave it away. So involve them with the things that are the pleasurable side of, of, of Ramadan. You know, they, they will remember the smell. They will remember how you set the table. For me, I, I le learned a very a big lesson from this. Uh, a couple of years ago, my mother was with us in Ramadan. And one day I wasn't here and she called me and she said, I did the table the way you do it. I did the fruit, I put it in the bowl where you usually put the fruit salad and I chopped the way you do it. it there is something about honoring the table when you put out your cutlery, when you put out your crockery, when you put out candles, when you put out whatever you put out. It's that Those are the associations. And, and I think that's just, just the bottom line, that's the baseline. If kids enjoy that, they will enjoy sitting with you reading Absolutely. the Quran. Absolutely. I think it's that's that's for me that's that's the recipe that the only thing I would recommend is teenagers like a lot of discussion. Yeah. And, and arguments. But yeah, they don't want to discuss, but if you poke them, provoke them, they will argue back. And if you can get them into an argument, a productive argument on a topic or a discussion point, they will participate, trust me. Especially if it tickles them. Yeah. So identify good topics and don't get get into an aggressive aggressive space. Try and discuss with them topics that would be relevant to them, but in a more engaging way, more exciting way. They need their blood to rush to their head. Hormones are buzzing all over them. So they need that engagement. With the teenagers, the last thing you want to do, well, I received an email yesterday saying a 15-year-old boy is, is addicted to his telephone, behaving very badly with parents, and the rest of it. And this is not the first time I've seen this, brothers and sisters. If you expose your children to 24-7 access to the internet, the phone, the iPad, the e-pad, the m-pad, whatever the things that you have at home, the computers, etc. If they're on it 24 hours a day with no restrictions, no supervision, you are leaving your chickens at the custody of a fox. Your chickens in the hand of a fox is a des des desperate, not even desperate, it's a recipe for death and destruction. A phone and access to the internet for teenagers is very destructive, very destructive. Their brains can't cope with such freedom. So you as parents, have to take responsibility. If you have failed in regulating it from the day they were little, little, in teenage years, you will have a war on your hands. That's why I say, please, if you've got young children, regulate their internet access and phone use now. And if you've got teenagers, you need to sit down and wean them off it and win their hearts. So win their hearts, but wean them off the addiction that they have. If they have got that in the phones, on the world, in the world of the internet, you don't know who they're talking to. You don't know what kind of friends they have. You don't know what kind of chats they're having with people. And kids are very smart. They'll delete all their history and records you won't even know. So you will not be able to stay on top of it. So it's best policy is to have no access to the phone or internet unsupervised. It's very important to regulate your children. People who have founded the internet, who created the social media, don't allow their children to have unfettered access mm -hmm. to those platforms. Zuckerberg doesn't allow his family to have the same. Even Bill Gates don't have Bill, iPads. Correct. Either. So I'm just telling you very simply and straightforward, there is no running away from this fact. Okay, we have... Um, so we have Imran, um, limit their usage, get them to do household chores, get them ready for their future and treat them afterwards. If they are 
um, if they don't listen, then ground them and ban their phones for a day or two. So I, I know every family has their own policies about um, social media and the use of it and whether you are allowing them or not. But I think there is one principle here that when it comes to spiritual home, how do we have clean conversations? When people are addicted to their phones, the language, the way of thinking, it's molded. The way the brain is getting wired for conversations, you know, it's really quick. Snapchat, you say something, you are not held accountable for it. You are not responsible for what you say because nobody takes you accountable. Mm. A clean conversation is you say something and you learn how to stand up for that opinion. This is what we can teach at home. How they deal with that outside in the world, it's this is the foundation we can give them. It's the empowerment. Clean conversations, meaning learn the art of arguments, learn the art of disagreement, learn how to state an opinion, have clear ideas of what you are talking about. Absolutely. Because they don't do this on social media. They just quickly send a message, keyboard warriors, they can assault anybody, they can, uh, uh, you know, they can just def offend anyone they want. No one is taking them accountable. So this idea that your children should be given unfettered access to the internet is a destructive, a destructive idea. Take control of that. Brothers and sisters, is very important. And with children, you need to empower them, especially teenagers, with the rule, with the right to make decisions. So, for example, our daughter, she went on a long walk yesterday as part of our school curriculum for something that they're doing. And alhamdulillah, we said, no problem. A week ago or two weeks ago, a week ago, she said to me, Daddy, it's going to be a very long walk. We're going to be walking for six, seven hours, and it's going to be very difficult. Do you think I should break my fast? I said to her very clearly that you know the rules of fasting. Allah has given you, we've taught you enough to know how to make a decision. Rights and wrongs of what you want to do is your decision, not mine. You decide. Don't ask me about it. So she thought about it. She mm. sat on it. She consulted her head about it, her emotions about it. Eventually she decided that she would not be fasting the day itself because it's going to be too difficult for her. I have 100% respect for her decision. Do you know why? Because she knows her body. I know she knows herself very well and I trust her judgment. I believe she would do the right thing because I've given her the right tools. So it's about giving your children the tools that they need, mechanism that they can use to be, come to a decision, engaging their brain, their hearts, their minds more actively, proactively at home, and then trusting them to make the right decision, and then allowing them to make mistakes and bringing them to account reasonably and rationally so that they can learn from it. That cycle of life. If you can do that with your teenagers and your children, I think you're fine. A spiritual hope is really about teaching each other not what to think, but how to think. Yes, how this, to think. This is what we do with our children. And I guess this is what we do with our spouse. You can never tell me how I should think. I can never tell you how you should think, but what to think, but how we think. And this is the only thing we do in a spiritual home. We, we need to understand that I, by telling somebody what to think is a way of control. Yes, yes. Teaching somebody how to think is an empowering act. Very empowering act. Beautifully actually put together. Somebody asked me how was my kisuri, which I made kisuri, which is a, a rice and lentil dish that Bangladeshis make, also Indians and Pakistanis make. It's associated with when you are not feeling well, you will not need some That's comfort. That's chicken soup. Yeah, ca ca comfort <laughs> food, chicken soup, of course. And um, I made it yesterday for the first time in many, many years. And I made it with brown rice and mm -hmm. unusual lentils, the chana dal, the bigger lentils. It came out delicious. I loved it. Obviously, my wife doesn't like it. I don't know how to make it. So, um, for you don't those even of like you... It. You don't want to even taste it. No, I, it's not my style. It's, it reminds me of something else. Because Never I mind. I wouldn't say on what it Never looks mind. Like. Don't insult us. Um, so, Salma Rahman says, Salam Alaikum. Um, Suhal Ullah says, Brother Ajmal, this probably isn't the right forum, but I hope you can cover this topic. Challenges that arise from working in modernized workplace. Another time, inshallah. There has been instances where colleagues encourage attending pubs and use of opportunities to discuss key work-related matters. In my mind, it feels um, it feels it affects my chances of career. I know this for sure. So, inshallah, another time, brother. Salma Rahman says, I've just joined. What kind of things can we do with kids instead of electronics? electronics? So that electronics seems to be the problem um, in a lot of households, especially now with the lockdown. I'll tell you what our children do. I like that about my daughter a lot more. She is more pen and paper for girls. Mm -hmm. She paints. She will cut things out. She will read. She will write. Really engages her brain at all levels. We have a bit of a struggle with our son because he's more electronically sounded. But we have to take control of it and regulate it. So my wife has a rule. 
You can use the computer, but every few minutes, every, you know, 45 minutes, use, get up and go and do something else for a little while. If you need to come back, you come back, but you don't need to stay on the computer all the time. But the same, on, in the same breath, I want to bring this in as well, is that my son has been the key help and support for your quiz. And it has to be done on the computer. Of course. But you can always ask them to do the things. So and he has really enjoyed it. And he loved it because he, it's design, it's getting the material, but he's learning heaps by putting a quiz together. Every single, single evening, my husband runs a well, quiz. Now is the 20th, 20th uh, uh, quiz. Nice, nice. So for 20 successive days, him, majority of the time, part of the time, my, my daughter, but they've done the questions, they've done the setup, layout. Ibrahim does it all the time. He's on our logo for this program. He does, he does, he does struggle with the timing. I need to remind him get away from the computer. But you see, there is there's something that you can do as a parent. You can give them quality material that they can work on. They can be on a computer and work on something. You know, they can create the quiz themselves, and you can give it to younger children of the family. You can distribute it in the mosque. You can run your own quiz show in the family. But ask the older children to design it. You and we, I, I got my daughter to edit all my writing that I did for my 30 Rules of Life course that I've been running for the whole month of Ramadan. And she did a fantastic job. And by that, she felt empowered. She felt part of it, alhamdulillah. You and see, it was her own learning. Absolutely. And this is one of the things that parents need to understand is that when children are part of what you are doing, you can't ask your children to become a genius if you are not pursuing yeah. something yourself. You can't imagine your child to be someone else if you are not giving them an example. Children do what we do. My yeah, partnership. Exactly. It's, it's about making them understand that what you do is important to you and you need their support. They give you so many interesting points. My daughter was looking at the book that I was writing. She said, Mom, this is not quite right. Can you do something else with that? Can you restructure? They, will, they get inspiration from you as a parent. Slight difference between that and making your children your counsellor. You share with them your problems. That's not the right thing. Mm. Don't share with your children your personal problems or your part of, your marital problems. That's not their business. What you're doing is you're bringing them to your life and you're, you're walking with them in their life in a partnership of learning, creativity, and most importantly, regenerating their brain and your brain so that you can be in sync. Just to finish off in the last couple of yes, minutes. Salma Rahman says, Salamu Alaikum. The quiz is definitely a positive aspect of electronic, mashallah. Sabrina says, um, I don't uh, give my one-year-old electronics good. Normal toys stimulate her. My sister-in-law was shocked in comparison to her niece and nephew, whereby they are addicted to the electronics. Electronics have a tendency of three things. So if you take a phone, there is a, a flickering light that's going on that really addic gets addicted to your brain. Secondly, it's constant stimulation. It's a, something constantly new. This desire to have something constantly new actually makes your children more compulsive. It's a problem. They can become compulsive, even lead to OCD in some cases. And third, that constant stimulation to think and rethink by artificial stimulant from the outside is a problem because then they don't allow their internal brain's stimulation to grow. Very problematic. Take the phones away. Take the electronic pads away. We say until the age of seven, eight, they don't need any of that. Move them away from them. And that's the bottom line. I actually think it's very dangerous for children. Even, even I, my, I'm quite, you know, traditionalist in this one. I believe in pen and paper. Our children didn't watch television until the age of five. There was no BBC, nothing, CBBS, none of those things. Because I think it just robs children of their childhood um, in a, in a way that you know we say it's, a, it's a bit of, out of them. exactly we say it's a bit of a, a harmless fun. I don't think it's harmless. I don't think anything is harmless that is artificial. And children are naturally capable of entertaining themselves. You know, they play with boxes, they play with whatever you give them, and they become creative in the process. Whereas sitting in front of a television, taking in lots of images coming and going, it doesn't make them think. It makes them watch and become a vegetable. Shirin Malik says, my daughter and I had great thing, uh, time playing the Kahoot quiz the other night, alhamdulillah. Then my eldest son joined in too. It's a great family thing. And we are, inshallah, we have, we're happy that we've been able to facilitate it. Anyway, it's over our time. It's past 12 o'clock. So got much to, we can talk about. We've got to get so on with much. it. So spirituality at home, just to recap, creating space for Allah in your life, number one. So number one is to create space for Allah in your head, creating space uh, in your mind that Allah is watching you all the time, creating, uh, giving Allah, uh, bringing Allah in, on your tongue by remembering Him, uttering words that you should do. Pray, uh, learning together, praying together, 
and many other things that we could have talked about we don't have the time to talk about today inshallah another time i'm sure we should probably continue it next week because we have one more session before ramadan inshallah aisha thank you so much both of you a wonderful fantastic session very important useful information that provided need to know every family alhamdulillah thank you aisha allah thank bless you. you we're going to finish now with yes. with a with a great what's the word yes i don't know what's the case but we're going to uh, promote our books. About That's what we're going to be doing. <laughs> so we have got, uh, if you go on our website. Who hasn't um, bought the book yet? I want to see a show of hands. Oh, no, no. Don't name and shame people. Um, <laughs> Who hasn't bought the book? Put your <laughs> hand up. Brothers and sisters, a book or two books we've been we've written about marriage and about heart smart. We, if you haven't bought the books, you haven't actually lived. I'm so sorry to say that. Joking. Please do buy the books. Buy it for yourself. Buy it for your family, your children, your niece, nephews, uncles, aunties, whoever it is. Buy this month of Ramadan. Make this your Eid gift. Make it an Eid gift. And um, the books that I'm selling, I always say this to people, 5% um, of all my books are always going to charity. So you are supporting, I usually support education of children who don't have access to education in the world. So my charity money goes to children's education. Um, if and my buy. book, Nobody Supports Barefoot's Work, and a lot of our work that we do from Barefoot Institute, all about marriage and relationship, we support, alhamdulillah. So make these books your Eid gifts. You buy them from our website, barefootinstitute.com. In our website, you can get in touch with us. You can go to the bookstore in the website. If you're getting married and if you want somebody to help you with the nikah process, inshallah, we're happy to do that. Any marriage counseling, relationship issues, any counseling you need, get in touch with us, inshallah. Spiritual counseling, we're offering a lot of, alhamdulillah, support work. Do support us. Stay tuned. Make dua exceptionally. Inshallah make dua, please. please. Please make dua for all of us. May Allah bless you all. May Allah accept your fasting from us. Uh, we will see you next week, inshallah, Sunday at 11. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.